Joining us here for the business of money, we have Lindsay William, founder of strictlybusinesspodcast.com, David Shapiro from Assessment Securities, and Mia Kruger, director at Kruger International. Thank you all for joining us. And Mia, let's kick off with you. News flow this week, obviously, uh, the retailers giving significant updates in terms of the impact of the looting and rioting in South Africa. So perhaps let's just start there. Is the situation as bad as we initially thought it was when we were chatting this time last week? Look, I'm not going to downplay uh, the seriousness of this issue. It's a big issue. But when we look at the numbers and what all the listed companies came out with, because we need to remember to make a big distinction between listed companies and what's really happening on the ground in South Africa, uh, the numbers were between about 7 and 10 or 11% of their businesses being affected by the looting. In many cases, that was the total number of completely looted and destroyed uh, um, shops and businesses. So we had all the big retailers come out with those numbers and they varied in between there. No one has really put a price on it yet. Uh, you know, there are estimations of about uh, 50 billion in, in, in damages in South Africa when we listen to various parties coming out with these estimations, but there really isn't a real number on it. I heard a conversation with Sasria uh, yesterday and they estimate that they'll probably have between a, um, 10 and 20 billion rands worth of claims. So initially they said it would be about seven and now they sort of heading to the 20 uh, figure. So it's very difficult to really estimate what the impact will be I think the, the positivity the past week of everyone jumping in, trying to make a difference, people taking food and supplies down to KwaZulu Natal, looking at the numbers really stabilizing in terms of, um, of, of transport and trucks, uh, movement around on, um, the KwaZulu Natal has really been encouraging. So yes, the impact will be big. We'll see what the numbers is when they are all when they come out. But uh, but yes, it is less bad than we initially thought. Last week it did seem like it was going to spill over all over the country, and it was really very centralised and isolated in, in Natal into a small part of of housing. And people have been rounded up here uh, uh, personally, and and, yes. and I don't know if that's the end of it because there'll always be simmering tensions. Uh, but when you talk about what did you say? Um, the, the, the price, uh, the price of the insurrection. Uh, a lot of people coming out and saying, including the South African Reserve Bank, incidentally, which came out with its, after its two-day meeting, came out with its uh, monetary policy committee decision on interest rates, which which was uh, unchanged. Uh, but the point is that they're, I think they're saying that they're shaving off a little bit of their, their GDP enthusiasm for this year and indeed next year. And David, um, some people saying that even even just ten days can set your economy back quite materially. I, I think in certain cases, or from certain analysts, 0.7%. Well, what the governor said, you know, why he downgraded or moderated his outlook for the year was confidence, jobs, investment, you know, and uh, around those issues. And we haven't had the impact. And I must tell you, I, um, a, a gentleman got hold of me who was, who's been pretty high up in the mining industry in South Africa, a very good name, ran some big businesses here in the mining industry, and just responded in a supportive way to some things that, that uh, we've been saying. Uh, and the one thing that, that just unsettled me, he said, you know, I've been talking to my friends in the UK, and they've come back and they said, South Africa is uninvestable. You know, mm -hmm. that was the word he used. In other words, uninvestable. Now, it's not, He's not a journalist, he's not in the media, he's not a sensationalist. He's a man who's been very, you know, heavily involved in, in running mining, in mining businesses in South Africa. And I found that worrying. I know we, we you know, we, we, we suggest that and we think it's going to happen. But I think that, you know, that, that was a view that kind of sums up where we are. Um, and we've got to make a situation, we've got to change it so that we do become investable. And at the moment, um, we're not really going you know, uh, that way, even though uh, the markets are holding up pretty well and holding up, I think, a lot better than we thought they would. Cyber attack, yeah, we need to bring in the, the cyber attack. That's uh, the recent news flow around Transnet and uh, the, the interruption to, to their business, which obviously is impacting the likes of, of Kumba Iron Ore, who can't actually now deliver 
um, the uh, materials that they are mining. This could be, and, and again, there's a, there's a lot of conspiracy theories doing the rounds that this is the next round of an attack to South Africa, no longer the physical looting and rioting, but cyber attacks. And we know we are very exposed given the digital acceleration that we have seen over recent times. Yes, look, we had that uh, trans, uh, transnet attack that they came out yesterday. They haven't been really clear about the extent of it, but it looks like it was really only isolated to the port uh, terminals where they, uh, where they operate with big uh, containers. So, and they said, you know, that they managed to normalize the activity by the end of yesterday. So we'll have to see how this plays out, but you are right. We, uh, we are vulnerable as everyone in the world really to, to cyber attacks. South Africa, I think, less vulnerable to cyber attacks due to the fact that we haven't really seen as much technological um, inv investigation and development here as we would have liked and as if I think uh, would have benefited South Africa by far by now. But it's never too late. The fact so remains... Mia, you're saying we're still on a manual system. Is that what you're trying to we, get we in a nice much, way? <laughs> pretty much we are. And I don't think, you know, when we discount the problems that Transnet, um, <laughs> that Kumba sit with, it's at all related to, to, uh, to cyber security. It's mostly related to the reliability of transport on their rail network. And, uh, you know, the numbers are staggering when you listen to Kumba. They had to adjust the, the estimated uh, sales for for the iron ore down by a, a million tons, which equates to about 3.2 billion rands of, of business. So that, that's massive taxes that the country is losing out on, massive business that our listed companies are losing out on. And the reality is the fact that we've, we, I mean, we've been talking about this for ages, where we're so dependent on ESCOM up until now, dependent on Transnet. And if we don't have this very basic infrastructure backbone in the country, Businesses can't operate, and that's another a bad, bad thing for, for investors looking from abroad, because they just say, why will we put money into this country, into investing into, uh, into companies, when we can't even operate within those various sectors? And that's, you know, that's a concern. So we'll have to hope that it, it'll, it'll get better. Well, uh, Mia, uh, the one million tons you just spoke about, it'll come back though. It hasn't disappeared. It's mm, not as if that no. one million tons has suddenly gone out of the system and won't be a revenue generator for the Republic of South Africa in the future. So it'll just come back gradually as long as logistics allow it. I want to ask all three of you, because here I am sitting in, in Northern Europe and I'm not on the ground and I don't hear the, the whispers and I don't hear the stories around the braai or the dinner party. Or the cocktail party. I, I, just to, is it all over? You talk about cyber attacks, and we've heard about the second wave, which might be more sinister, with uh, strategic facilities being targeted. Is it all over now in South Africa? Was there a moment in time? Who wants to take this one? So well, I'll jump in, and then David. I mean, I don't think that we can emphatically say anything at this stage. I, I, there's there's a lack of visibility and uncertainty, and you know we we've got the defence minister and Cyril Ramaphosa taking the leadership podium with completely divergent views. So I would say we're pretty much flying blind at the moment in terms of what could potentially happen in the future. David, I don't know if that's a, a little bit too. I, I, I yeah. think I think what you've highlighted is exactly what people are worried about here. Yeah just the total lack of leadership and the incompetence of the people at top. There is no management. You know, this is, uh, Bronwyn says we're flying blind. It's exactly that. We're not, there is no one taking leadership and trying to uh, give us some kind of confidence that we're going to get out of this. Um, and, and the calls, you know, if you look at the headlines, all the calls are to press the reset button, meaning get rid of the people, get rid of those uh, people in cabinet who have no backbone or are not contributing. So I think, Lindsay, the big message is if you want to prevent uh, further insurrection, or you want to prevent further incidents like this, you need to put in place a, a very strong government, you know, people that show leadership. And I don't know whether we've got the people to draw on, or well, they're certainly not putting their hand up. That's where our weakness is at the moment, uh, is, is, is in Cyril and the people around him at the table. Um, it's, you know, for me, that's the worry. 
Okay, well, let's, um, let's leave that for now because it's out of our hands. I think the next big thing might be um, uh, former President Zuma's uh, appearances in court. He was in escort this week. He might have to go to Peter Maritzburg in the future. And if that is less controversial uh, than his uh, arrest for, you know, whatever it is, if it's less controversial, it might be a smooth transition to something approaching normality. Let's have a look back at the week, though. The business of money needs to look back at what happened because on Monday morning we woke up, the markets were a little bit soggy and then they became a mush. And it was at one stage, the All Share Top 40 index was down 3% on Monday and the All Share index itself was down nearly 3,000 points. And we thought, goodness, this is a bad spot for the week. It's going to look horrible. But in true market style, it bounced back on Tuesday, uh, along with the international markets. The buying on Tuesday was followed by buying on Wednesday, and it's all been nice and stable since then. And if you put up a graph, Bronwyn, uh, let's do it this way, if you put up a graph of the S&P 500, and you overlay headlines to do with COVID on that graph, you'll see that every time the market dips because of a COVID headline, it bounces back and mere, I, it, it, I don't know why we don't learn. Just buy when there's a COVID scare. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, that's definitely been a theme, especially when you consider what happened on Tuesday and, and Wednesday. Uh, but even locally, you know, after last week, I had a number, I had a look at the numbers um, out where we look at the numbers that JSE brings out, telling us how many foreigners sold or what the amount is that foreigners sold in our market. And um, as we all saw, you know, on Monday, we had a bit of a pullback here. Uh, and it's rebounded, we're above that. But the foreigners sold more than 8 billion rands of equities last week, which now actually led to the fact that we have uh, overtaken our position by this time last year. So up until now, we've been uh, better off than we were last year in terms of, of foreigners selling out of our market, but now we've overtaken that. But just to get back on the focus of the international front, you know, there's... Um, they were sort of a quiet week or two and so on with the start of the uh, of the earnings season and people love to now, uh, you know, voice their concerns on COVID every time there's nothing else to talk about. Mm. But uh, as soon as we started seeing the news flow come out of these companies of the US beating estimates, uh, showing us a really, really good earnings season that we're in the midst of, <laughs> it's actually supported the, the market further. And I think that will probably be the case during this earnings season. Uh, we, we, we've seen good numbers from the company so far. We haven't seen the big tech yet. That's coming next week. But so far, I'm I'm very I've been soothed by the economic sort of uh, conditions in the U.S. especially, and I mean that's the main driver of of money worldwide. Can I bring it home, David? I don't think we can have this conversation on the week that uh, transpired with our BHP bulletin, Anglo American, and coming back to that big resource under uh, underpin that mm. we repeatedly to speak about on this show. I'm bullish on it. I know that uh, most analysts believe that commodity prices are going to slow down and start falling as this global economy or the post-pandemic global economy settles. I can't think of another word, but it settles back to where it was that we'll see commodity prices come back. I don't see that. You know, the talk about infrastructure, the need to reset the world economy and refocus the world economy, I think is going to keep the demand for uh, commodities going. It might change shape, you know, it might go from uh, one to another, but um, I still, I'm still quite optimistic. And I think that some of the values that we're getting in our big miners, I think are, are just too juicy to uh, ignore. The worry, and this is the big worry, is that they're going to take all the money or the new leaders who take over these businesses are gonna take the money and go and be frivolous and buy some, you know, try and expand their operation. I think that's a big fear. But I don't think you can ignore the numbers that we're producing. I, I find them uh, very encouraging and I think you're gonna get some strong returns or good returns um, out, of, uh, out of the miners. They're money printing yeah. machines, David and mm. me and Bronwyn. They're, they're, it's extraordinary. The, the, the Anglo stable coming out with numbers and the market saying, okay, it's, it, normally you get buy the rumor, sell the fact, but it was uh, buy the rumor, buy the fact as well after those operational and trading updates uh, this week. What I've, got, what I've got in mind those now is, is the commodity conundrum because it's so easy to get mm. by iron ore between 20 and 30 and 50 and 100 rand. A share. It's so easy to get in. It's a high quality company. Everyone's going to need iron ore. 
uh, in, in our current world that needs um, fossil fuels and old style industries. Uh, so that's easy. The commodity conundrum now to me is where to get out. And we've discussed this on this platform before. It's easy getting in, getting out. Do you get out when a share has gone from 20, 30 rand up to 600, 700 rand? Do you get out now or do you think, well, maybe it's going to go to a thousand? Obviously, mandates dictate that you have to trim your position occasionally because you can't have too much of a percentage in a particular stock or sector. How do you get out, Mia? How do you get out of a commodity yeah. when you've made so much money out of it? Well, it's one of those things that you won't know until you, you know it's time. So at this stage, it's not time yet. We see a lot of positive drivers that give us the, the, all the information we need that the sector is going to grow, that uh, <laughs> demand is high. Yes, but we, we you know, I think... Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you when you get out, when the analysts turn optimistic, <laughs> then we get out. Okay. <laughs> But there was, a, there was an interesting story, no problem, that I saw yesterday that we can maybe touch on that. There are a couple of long-term drivers uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this sector, and one of them was highlighted yesterday when we saw the deal uh, struck between Tesla and BHP Billiton in their nickel mine in, in Australia, where they will now be exclusively supplying nickel to Tesla for the production of batteries. So it was very interesting to me also to read the last couple of months that Tesla, or that uh, rather BHP, BHP Billiton has been, or BHP Group has, has mentioned that they supply 75% of their nickel to the battery producing sector. And that's definitely a theme. I mean, when you look at all the listed uh, motor vehicle companies coming out, they've got big targets of becoming uh, uh, electric vehicle producers by 2030, 2025, et cetera. They've got big targets and it will be difficult for them to reach if they don't put extensive amounts of money into battery manufacturing. So we have to consider these, uh, these uh, precious metals that go into the battery uh, manufacturing and nickel and cobalt, two of the big ones, a cobalt being more expensive and nickel sort of there's a short supply of it in the world so bhp is in a good position to capitalize on this you know on and the other hand the big story bronwyn on that just the opposite is that bhp announced they want to get out of their oil assets yes. because they'd rather get out now than in a few years time when they won't be able to sell it so you can see the contrast that are happening in commodities so nickel on the one hand attracting investment Oil, on the other hand, the other way around. Can we move to stocks of interest at this juncture? Lindsay, you look poised to say something. Are you happy with us to go to stocks of interest? Of course. It's just a, 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 the backdrop of the last couple of minutes on commodities. I'm just looking at the CRV index now. It's at a six-year high. The CRV index, for those that don't know, it's, it stands for Commodity Research Bureau Index. It's a basket of everything from lean hog prices to iron ore prices. It is a six-year high this morning, so don't stand in the way of the commodity bull run, as David and Mia have said. 